Thank you everybody for joining us. My name is Ivan Rodriguez. I'm the Technical Programs Director for the INCOSI Canada chapter. I, I want to introduce our speakers, Lou Wecraft. Lou is a longtime system engineer, so he has over 50 years experience in systems engineering, including 22 years with the United States Air Force. And 23 of those years, uh, Lou has been an active member of NCOSI, uh, and he's been chairing the Requirements Working Group for some time now. And Lou has conducted a lot of different symposiums, webinars, et cetera, so he's done over 200 requirements seminars, and he works with a variety of sectors. He's an internationally renowned and recognized expert in systems engineering, and he has a specialization in requirements solicitation, requirements management, requirements analysis. Uh, V&V across the uh, life cycle. So uh, a really good resource for us to have joining us tonight. Lou, thank you for joining us and I'll turn the screen over to you for your presentation. So I want to give a brief overview in the requirement working group and then I'll get into the main presentation. We just recently updated the charter and you can read the, the new charter on the requirements webpage. We want to advance the practice education theory system engineering through the excellence and needs and requirements definition management, verification, validation across the life cycle. And we're contributing to the realization of NCOSI's vision 2035. Uh, I'm not going to go through the rest of this. Uh, you can read it later. So I am the chair. Tammy Katz, the last four years, she was the chair. Tammy is actually now assistant director of tech ops. And then next year, she'll become the director of tech ops. Mike Ryan was chair before me. Kevin Orr is one of our co-chairs. Kevin manages all of our monthly meetings. And if you have any topics you'd like us to address at one of our monthly meetings or would like to present our monthly meetings, contact Kevin Orr to get on our schedule. And then Jeff Williams and Katrashina Cott became co-chairs at IW. Katrashina is in charge of our website. So we have both the external public facing website as well as our internal INET website. I'll talk about a little bit more. We have 1,433 followers on Viva Engage. So we're one of the NCOSI's largest working groups. Our Viva Engage channel is fairly active. A lot of people are using it now to ask questions, getting help from members on requirement related type things. So that's one of the big benefits of becoming a member of NCOSI. At IW 2023, we received a product of the year award for our various products that we have and also our all of our outreach activities that we're doing when it comes to getting people involved in our activities and also encouraging them to become members of NCOSI. And then at IW 2024, we got our Sustained Performance Award also for 2023. We're really proud of that. Like I talked about our Yammer community, if you haven't got involved in that, you know, feel free to do so. It's a great resource to communicate and be involved. One thing that came out of COVID was we started the virtual meetings and with virtual meetings and Zoom, we can record things. Our recordings, I've edited a lot of them and then put them on our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and search for NCOSI RWG, you go to a YouTube channel and there's 70 some videos there right now that we put on there from the last four years. We're really big on putting together products. We authored about six or seven different sections of the System Engineering Handbook that was just released. Tammy's leading the effort to bring the CBOC up to the System Engineering Handbook, and our needs and requirements manual is our primary product. Then we have supplemental guides. Other working groups are developing supporting guides. The System Security Engineering Working Group is developing a tailored guide referencing parts of the manual. We're involved in developing some supporting guides also. Jeff Williams is working on a guide to model-based needs and requirements that we'll be releasing within the next year or so. We are in the process of updating the needs and requirements manual to a version two, and then Wiley is going to publish the needs and requirements manual, just like they published the System Engineering Handbook, and that'll be free to NCOSI members, and then Wiley will be happy to sell you copies also. And then we have our supporting guides to go with that. The Needs and Requirements Manual, Section 14 on Needs, Requirements, Verification, Validation, Management is what this presentation is going to be tonight. Various sections of the Needs and Requirements Manual is already on our YouTube channel that you can go to, but we're going to focus on the managing part, Section 14. The key thing that we're pushing on all of our products is that we don't like organizational silos. We want an integrated multidiscipline collaborative project team that has people representing a lot of different areas, both from a system engineering standpoint 
as well as a project management standpoint. From a team standpoint, we advocate there's a core team that's made up of both the lead project management person and system engineering person that can be supported by their own project management and integration working group and a system engineering and integration working group supported by subject matter experts and then life cycle stage support personnel as well. We're assuming in all of our stuff and in tonight's presentation that we have this integrated multidiscipline collaborative team. So I just talk about project team in general. I don't talk about a design team or an architecture team or requirements team. I just talk about a project team that's made up of all these people. We've taken this holistic view of both project and system engineering management. And a lot of you have probably seen this. This is the flagship figure that we have that shows that needs and requirements for verification and validation are common threads that tie all the SE lifecycle activities and artifacts together. That doesn't happen in a vacuum. There's got to be management involved to make all that happen. And on the bottom, what I call design controls, the term comes from the US FDA Title 21, Part 820 for medical devices, and they're part of a larger quality management system. You notice that for all the transitions from one thing to another, we have sets of organizational requirements on the project team. That's one thing that needs to be defined up front is these requirements on the project team, work instructions involved in that. And when it comes to requirement management within different groups, it's interesting that while Project Management Institute, the SEI, CMMI group, and NASA have a separate process area for requirements management, but yet 15288 doesn't. And so the NCOC system engineering handbook doesn't. 29148, the standard for requirements, they do mention requirements management, but not as a separate process. The NCOC system engineering handbook idea is, is that all the activities I'm talking about are covered in other process areas, but they don't really talk about them, say, focus into requirement management. And the other thing, because we're really focused on needs and requirements, as well as verification validation. So rather than just requirements management, we're talking about needs, requirements, verification, validation, management. We want to separate the management of the different processes and activities and data from the execution of those activities. So if someone's got to oversee this and make sure it's happening, and that's what the focus of this section is, is talking about that. So it's a cross-cutting series of activities that spans all lifecycle process activities. His focus is to manage the artifacts that result from performing those activities. These requirements for verification management involves defining, baselining, overseeing the organizational lifecycle concept, needs and requirements, definition, policy, requirements, processes, and work instructions, and defines and baseline and oversee the organization, the verification, validation, policies, requirements, process, and work instructions as well. Provide the enablers needed to implement these policies, and I'll show you those enablers in a minute. And the big thing is ensuring alignment and consistency between all the artifacts and the projects, plans, budgets, schedules, and work products, and other system engineering project management artifacts generated across the life cycle. That's one of the things about how I define MBSE is moving from a document-centric to a data-centric practice of system engineering. And as such, we want to have all the different traditional documents represented within a federated, integrated data information model than any of those documents that are just reports generated from this common source of data and information. We have IPO diagrams for each of the sections in the Needs and Requirements Manual. We have in the blue the inputs. We have enablers. We have the outputs. And then actually doing the activities. Inputs into this, we have the life cycle concepts and needs definition activities, that's section four and section five of the manual. From that, we have our integrated set of needs and other artifacts. From that, our design input requirement are defined, what you call system requirements. Design input is a more precise way of talking about these requirements. Again, that comes to the medical device world. And then we have design verification validation activities. Then we have our system verification process and our system validation process. All these activities have a lot of artifacts generated as part of those activities. All of these are inputs into this management process. Enablers to make all this happen is at the enterprise level, there needs to be data governance. In today's world, that's really important. Who's accountable for data information, but also protection of that, security type aspects. Our information management infrastructure, our configuration management, risk management, project management, system engineering, 
and product development are all high level processes that are defined at the enterprise level. And then all the projects work underneath those process areas and there's requirements that they have to adhere to as part of each one of those. And then we have the needs and requirements management process and plans, system verification, system validation process and plans. None of this makes any sense if we don't have trained system engineers in those processes, trained and knowledgeable experience. We need tools, requirement management tool, diagramming modeling tools, and then we don't want to forget the project management tools. I'll show you a little bit later, we want to be able to share the information from all these tools into a common federated integrated data information model. So in preparing is making sure all the enablers are in place. If they're not, we're going to be in trouble. They're all prerequisites to successful system engineering. Gather and obtain access to all their input artifacts that we're going to manage, both their development as well as manage them. And a lot of project level plans that are done at the beginning, a project management plan, a system engineering management plan, a needs and requirements definition management plan. In some cases, that might be included within the SAMP. A lot of cases, because of all the different things that are involved in that, they'll make it a supporting plan to the SAMP. System verification, validation management plans, configuration management plans. And we got to stay engaged with our stakeholders throughout the life cycle. So we should have a stakeholder communications management plan and how the project team is going to interact with all the external stakeholders throughout the life cycle. With all the inputs in green and then doing the preparing, we have a set of activities that are involved in performing needs requirements, verification, validation, management. For the rest of the presentation, I'm going to walk through each of these. First thing is, from a management standpoint, we've developed the processes that are involved in defining our needs requirements in our design output specifications. Then they all need to be baseline, put under configuration control. So that's a key starting point is putting them under configuration control. Baselines are reference points establish a key milestone gates across the life cycle. In classical system engineering, they really represent a maturity of the project to the point where the project's ready to spend more time and money to go to the next phase of the project. Historically, this has been equated with waterfall, but in reality, when you look at how system engineering is defined in the system engineering handbook in our products, the activities, a lot of them are done concurrently, not serially. And so there's a lot of feedback loops. There are points in time when management has to put the foot down and say, do we know enough? Do we understand feasibility enough to start spending more money? That's really the purpose of the gates. A key issue for a lot of projects is when do you baseline? If you baseline too early, then that results in unnecessary amount of extra work as the art artifacts mature. Because once you baseline things, you put them under configuration management. Now I have a formal process for change control. And if I do it too early, that formal process can eat up a whole lot of time and effort on your project team. It's kind of a waste. However, if you wait too late, then people may start doing things because of changes. They might have to do a lot of rework. And the, the later you get into the process, the more expensive that rework can be. So it's a challenge for projects to have that balance between when they should baseline or not. I know in the case of highly regulated products, if you baseline too early, you may have to start informing a higher authority every time you make a change, whereas you don't have to if you haven't done a baseline. So that's a you know, consideration to do also. And prior to the baseline, artifacts undergo verification validation. So that chart I showed you before, verification validation is occurring across the life cycle. So we're going to verify and validate our needs, make sure they're done properly and they communicate the right things. And then when they transform those into a set of design input requirements, we got to verify and validate them, that they're properly formed and they communicate the intent of the needs properly. And then when we have a design and our design output specs, we got to verify and validate those. And then we have the realized system, then we're going to verify and validate realized system against the needs and requirements. And so whenever we're going to do a baseline, we're going to do that verification validation activities. In some text, they talk about different kinds of baseline. Functional baseline is where you've baselined a system level set of design input requirements. And in some cases, 
is that functional baseline that you contract out to a supplier, and then they'll develop an architecture, they'll decompose flow down requirements within that architecture. An allocated baseline is then when you define your requirements for each part of the architecture, then that total family of requirements then is your allocated baseline. And then when you've completed your design and have your set of design output specifications that you're actually going to make the system to, then some people refer to that as the product baseline. So something to consider those different kinds of focus of the baselines. The baseline integrated set of needs sets the design input requirements and sets the design output specifications represent an agreement between the customer, internal or external, and the developing project team, internal, external, responsible for whatever the system of interest is. And once baseline, like I said, these things are put under configuration management in accordance with the enterprise's defined plan, or a project may have a sub plan for how they're going to do configuration management. If the artifacts are contract deliverable, then the contracting organization will accept and approve work product as defined in the contract deliverable requirements list, CDRL, that's part of the contract. Uh, baselining and configuration management of the artifacts is normally responsibility of some change configuration control board. And once baseline, any changes then have to be submitted through that board. For supplier developed system of interest, the BS configuration function both for the customer organization as well as supplier organization. In this case, it's important the customer clearly defines in the statement of work the relationship between the two boards and which changes must be submitted to the customer board and what can be managed by the supplier board. Uh, one criterion could be whether the change will trigger a contract change. If that's the case, you would have to go to the customer's board. And the criterion can also depend on the type of contract. Fixed price, performance-based level effort could influence that also. The approach to regulation management and baselining of the various artifacts is different depending on whether organizations use a document-centric versus a data-centric approach to SE. So if it's document-based or is it document-centric, then you're baselining individual documents. And as a result, it's a challenge to keep each document current consistent with the other documents often resulting in there being no authoritative source of truth for the project. I've seen a lot of projects where some documents, they just baseline them and put them on the shelf and they collect dust and they move on to other things and they may not be updated when other things are updated down the life cycle. That could be a real issue. And then just the time and effort to maintain all those documents is really a problem. The real intent of MBSC is to move from a document-centric to a data-centric practice of system engineering. And so all the information that would normally be in the documents is included in the underlying data and information database, which is one type of model, if you want, rather than individual documents. If you need a document, it's an output from this, and it's current only to the point when you hit the print button for that report. And as such, and a sort of source of truth can be established within the data information model that's managed within your project tool set. So from a configuration management standpoint, you configuration manage the data information model. And the tools allow you to do that by copying a version and taking away the write permissions. So now that's a fixed baseline. You can't change it. And then you have an, a copy of that that can be modified that then evolves into the next baseline. You have traceability and all that information is linked for consistency. So you really can get toward having this authoritative source of truth for your project. So once we've baselined everything, uh, we need to monitor the status of those things. And so monitoring the needs, requirements, specifications provides project stakeholders insight into the status of the needs and requirements definition process across the lifecycle activities, helping to maintain a level of insight in collaboration. And this is really important in today's increasingly complex software intensive systems. The overall status and needs and requirements definition management activities, uh, key metrics and their implementation into design outputs with the design definition process should be captured and communicated to the stakeholders in accordance with the stakeholder communication management plan. And associated metrics should be captured and maintained within the project's integrated data set and communicated via the reports and dashboards shared with the project stakeholders. So everyone can kind of feel a pulse of the project and see where the issues are.
And a major use of attributes discussed in the manual is to aid in the management and reporting the status of the project in terms of needs and requirements in their implementation and system verification and validation in progress. The needs and requirements manual has a section just on attributes. This is a list of the attributes. This list was also put in the system engineering handbook as well. Not every organization is going to use all of these, but they all are defined in what their use is. They really do help project management as much as they do system engineers in management of the project and getting the status of the project. So it's something for you to look into when you're setting up your project at the beginning, you're setting up your tools, is the project needs to define which attributes that you're going to maintain. And they don't come for free. It takes time and effort to keep the data current. And if you're not going to keep the data current in the attributes, it's kind of a waste of time. So it's a commitment the project's going to make. But what value is there to maintaining these? Define that at the beginning of your project so you can better manage your project. The next thing is control. But controlling the needs and requirements in the specifications. When I say needs, requirements, specifications, I'm really talking about the design input requirements versus design output specifications. And I only use the word specifications in terms of design outputs. And I understand other people use requirement specifications to talk about sets of design input requirements, but it gets confusing when we say word specification and we're not specific. Are we talking about requirements, specification, a design specification, a as-built specification, or a build-to specification? There's all kinds of different specifications. In all the our products, we talk about design input requirements, design output specifications. And so controlling is a shared activity between project management, configuration control, system engineering, procurement, and quality control personnel. Again, we don't like silos, though. So that's why we have that integrated team that we're talking about. So controlling involves several different activities. We got to control the number of needs and requirements, as well as helping to ensure the sets of needs and requirements are feasible in terms of cost, schedule, technology, and risk. We have to control and manage change. Requirements defined at system level flow down through allocating budgeting to the next level of architecture. So we have to manage that. A big part of system engineering is managing the interactions, the interfaces between parts of the architecture, as well as interactions with the system of interest with external systems, including users, operators, maintainers, and disposers. Someone's got to be in charge of that and make sure things are defined and configuration managed. I have a separate section on that. And we have to ensure the design input requirements are implemented during the design definition process and that making a system of interest per the resulting design output specs will result in a system of interest that can be verified to meet the design input requirements and validated to meet its integrated set of needs. And then we have verification, validation, and, and all the artifacts associated with that across the life cycle. So one of the things we talk about is we define this needs and feasibility and risk bucket. And so part of managing is while we're defining our needs in, an, in a similar bucket for requirements, is that we don't just accept any need or requirement that people propose. We go through an assessment in terms of cost schedule, technology, and risk. It has to pass our criteria before we put it in the bucket. And because there's a lot of unknowns, you know, project wants to have reserves to take care of those unknowns as well. Whenever we're talking about controlling the size or the number of our needs and requirements, we're really talking about what goes in the bucket, what doesn't go in the bucket. And we also use that for change control, which I'll talk about a little bit later. There's always unknowns when we're defining our needs and requirements. It's just a fact of life. Uh, we don't know everything up front. So during the definition of needs and design input requirements, there may be unknowns resulting in the project team having to make assumptions regarding criteria to allow subsequent life cycle activities to proceed. And this often happens when the project team skips the life cycle analysis and maturation activities prior to defining the integrated set of needs and transforming the sets of design to put requirements. In other cases, further analysis is still required that we didn't interrupt the workflow to develop and baseline a complete integrated set of needs and resulting set of design input requirements. For example, the maturation of uh, critical technologies. 
in that case. We may have a performance value specified, but the technology to achieve that performance may not be mature enough. And so we have a maturation plan in place. And so we're not sure exactly what is feasible until we can mature the technologies needed. So to stop everything might not be practical. So we have to take that into account. And so we want the work to continue, but it's critical to capture all the unknowns and result in ongoing work to ensure the associated activities to address the unknowns are funded, tracked, and managed. One common method is to use TBDs, TBRs, indications in a needed requirement statement in place of or in addition to an actual value. And when the actual value has not been determined, this is often represented as a TBD, while a starting value that's not confirmed may be stated as a to be resolved. We think it's this, but there's some unknowns that we have to deal with. Some more analysis. So generically, TBDs and TBRs are referred to as TBXs. And each TBX is a placeholder that indicates additional work that needs to be done. As such, all TBXs need to be identified and managed formally as action items. You want a person within the organization to be assigned to manage the resolution of each TBX by a specific date. In the case where there's a customer is contracting out to a supplier and the customer requirements have TBXs, they must decide who's responsible for resolving that. The resolution of each has to be signed to the supplier, must be addressed in the statement of work, along with the requirements for the supplier to do the work needed to resolve the TBXs. So this extra work is in the proposal or in the tender, the supplier's proposal would then reflect from a budget and schedule standpoint, the extra work and analysis to resolve those TBXs. One mistake that's often made is that's not reflected, and then you end up with expensive contract changes, which you'd like to avoid. The effort for resolution of the associated technical debt is often referred to as TBX management. And I use the word technical debt here because you're pushing off something to later in the life cycle. And anything you push off later is like taking out a loan. You're accumulating technical debt. And it's going to cost more the later you push off the resolution of those. So keeping track of TBXs allows awareness the maturity of the needs and designed to put requirements throughout the life cycle. And it's a valuable metric to evaluate completion and maturity of your sets of needs instead of design input requirements. Ideally, you wouldn't want to issue a contract with TBXs in it. And there's no way that the design team can design to a TBX. You know, it's got to be resolved as a design input for them to be able to actually come up with a design. While it's important to reduce technical debt to prevent work later, it's also important to resist the temptation to set a questionable value with little or no underlying analysis that overly constrains the resulting design to remove the TBX. It's really not to your best interest to just to pull a number out of the air and throw it in there if you don't have any justification rationale for that number. Because then change is going to bite you later on, especially when the feasibility issue raises its head again. So the next thing is managing change. And that's a big part of the management. It involves changes to the needs, the design put requirements, design output specs, all of our system verification artifacts, system validation artifact over the life cycle. We actually start planning for system verification, system validation as we write our needs and our requirements. And that planning is going to have to feed into our schedule and budget. And so we have to manage that throughout the life cycle. Project must define change management process at the beginning of the project in the various project plans. Usually the change is managed again in their configuration management plan. All change requests must be captured and placed under configuration control. In addition to the change request, the impact analysis, and any other documents created during the change request process must be captured. And the status and disposition of the change request should be readily available to all the relevant stakeholders and monitored through change logs. And that's a nice thing about requirement management tools and other tools is that whenever you change something, that whole change history is maintained within the tool. So if a requirement goes through five revisions, just at a click of a button, you can review all those five revisions to that requirement. And that's true of any of the artifacts that are managed within the requirement management tool. So all changes should be subjected to a review and approval cycle to ensure the resulting change needs and requirements have the characteristics and traceabilities maintained to ensure that impacts of any proposed changes are fully assessed. The needs and requirements instability is a leading cause of change, and the needs and requirements 
verification, validation, ma management, monitoring, ensure the requested change in process through the project change control process. Scope creep, needs creep, requirements creep are all terms you all know about. We want to protect against. Some growth may not be warranted. Other growth is just, so I, I think change happens. We have to be able to manage change or change will take over the control of your project. That bucket I talked about before, once I baseline the bucket, when change comes along, then if we're going to add something, then we have a choice. If the bucket's already full and we've assigned priority to the requirements, then maybe we could take out a lower priority requirement to add the newer priority requirement. In some cases, we can use the reserves to take care of the additional requirements. A lot of times the management doesn't want to remove anything, so you're increasing the risk to the project when you start overfilling the bucket. The concept of the bucket is really a good thing to do this. I was associated with a project once where they were successful. They got a reward for it. The project manager said he had three key rules that controlled change. He said, if it's not broke, it's not safe, or breaking the law, then leave it alone. He would say no to any other changes if they didn't fall into one of these three categories. That approach may be draconian, but it, it's something that worked for him. And a key thing in the data-centric world, with all the data that's managed within the database and linked through traceability, when a change occurs to any of these artifacts, I can easily assess the impact of that change. So that's another reason for MBSE and moving to a data-centric practice of system engineering is that we have this data information model now that links all this information together and making change impact assessment much easier. We don't have one tool. We have a set of tools that we're going to use. So we may have a requirement management tool and language-based modeling tools. We're modeling our physical configuration items and other dedicated tools, risk management, configuration management, verification validation tools. Vendors now are developing what I call data integration tools that supports linking the data information developed in different tools. For instance, there's tools now that I can have a well-formed requirement that exists in both a SysML model and a requirement management tool, and the tool links them together. And if I'm in the SysML modeling tool and I click on the requirement text and I want to update it, it will automatically open up the requirement management tool and let me make the change in the requirement management tool. What's well, the same requirement expressed in two different tools, I keep them consistent and the same. So that's a thing that we need to do when it comes to establishing an authoritative source of truth for our project. Another thing is managing the control, flow down, allocation, budgeting. We had different levels, uh, organization strategic levels, all those plans, data governance are at that level. The operation level, that's where stakeholder needs and requirements are being developed. That's where our projects are formed. And then we have our product system level. And then we have subsystems and lower level system elements. So it's an architecture and requirements defined at one level flow down to the other level. And so our requirements definition and our architecture definition process area is actually done concurrently in managing that flow down. A key thing is budgeting. So performance, form kind of things, physical attributes, the quality requirements are they're defined system level, then they're budgeted or apportioned to the subsystem system elements that have a role in realization of that. Budgets need to be managed and controlled at the integrated system level. A critical concept associated with requirements of budgeting is that budgeted quantities result in requirements that have a dependency. Change in one will result in need to change another. So you can see underneath this one blue line here, I have an equation. So the parent requirements on the left, the child requirements that were budgeted portions of this make up the equation on the right. To keep that equation in balance, I have to manage this as an equation. And that's one thing that the SysML model tool is really good at is being able to establish those relationships for that. Budgets must be carefully controlled as they tend to change as the design matures. At the beginning of the project, we may have quite a bit of uncertainty as to the budgeted values. Then as the project matures, we have better knowledge. Some subsystems may be over, some may be under, and we have to do some threading between different groups, but we got to always keep that in balance. Because of the uncertainties, we define margins to help us manage that dynamic nature of our budgeted values. Here's an example of budgeting. Here I have an instrument that's doing some earth observation thing, and in the end, the data gets to some observer on the ground 
uh, maybe you and you're watching TV and watching satellite image or something. There's a whole lot of different systems involved through that whole chain. Time is involved in each one of these. I think there's like 14 Delta T's. And so someone has to budget all that. There's an overall system requirement. The time that data is taken until it's available to the observer or some amount of time, but that's split up amongst all these different parts that are involved in that. And then the quality of the image, pointing, accuracy, jitter, bandwidth are all budgeted items also. So this is a big part of that flow down. Combining allocation traceability helps us manage their requirements and combining these, it's really powerful. Unfortunately, the allocation concept is not well understood as traceability. So some feel they can use a traceability matrix to assess allocation, but this is a bad assumption. Just because a parent has children doesn't mean they're the right children. It doesn't mean those child requirements are actually traced to the proper parent. A lot of times the traceability matrices only have requirement numbers in it, so I really can't assess the validity. And I, I find it kind of comical when I go to conferences and I talk to different tool vendors and they really don't understand the concept of allocation. And the way I know that is I say, give me a report that lists all child requirements that trace to a parent requirement that was not allocated to the subsystem system element in which the child requirements exist. I say that and their eyes glaze over because they really don't understand what the concept of allocation versus traceability. A lot of defects that we want to look at, parent requirements that don't have any child requirements, so they're not being implemented. Needs with no implementing design input requirements, so the needs aren't being implemented. An orphan that doesn't trace to a source, so why is it there? Orphan requirements that don't trace to a need parent or source, again, why are they there? Need source of requirements with incorrect or missing implementing children. Child requirements with incorrect parent or source. Sets of child requirements that aren't necessary and sufficient to implement the parent. So these are all defects that I can use to assess that. This is hard doing this, it takes a lot of time. If I ask people if they actually do this assessment, sadly, the answer is often no, which means that by definition, they can have a lot of defects when it comes to allocation traceability within their requirement set. Using a data-centric approach, advocating the needs and requirements manual can really help. So going back to this figure, modern requirement management tools allow you to define this uh, traceability relation mental model in the tool. And then you can set up rules so that the tool will actually tell you when there's a missing link, like a little red triangle or something. So it helps make sure that when you enter in new information, that you establish the traceability right then and there in the tool. If you look at a lot of the regulations for highly regulated systems, they want to see traceability across the life cycle, whether it's a medical device, whether it's automotive industry, whether it's aircraft industry. They all want to see traceability. So if I've defined a risk through my risk assessment, they want to see the risks that are going to be mitigated by my system. They want to see that reflected in the needs. They want to see requirements. They want to see those requirements flow down to the subsystems. They want to see system verification validation it says that the system actually met those requirements and met those needs. So they want to see this traceability across in order to show compliance. And the same with any standard regulation that's invoked on your system, they want to be able to see that you've actually implemented those and that you are compliant with those standard regulations. Managing interfaces, this has got to be a key job of the project team. Given the behavior of a system as a function of the interaction as parts, it's critical the project team identify and define each of these interactions. Failure to do so is going to lead into a lot of problems. Managing interfaces includes the oversight and management of the identification interface boundaries, identification of the interactions, defining and agreeing on definitions of each interaction, identifying risk associated with each interaction of the boundaries, and defining the interface requirements for each interaction. Managing interface is a major activity across the lifecycle. There's many issues found during system integration that involve an interface. They're very common, and if they're not managed, you can have some really serious problems when it comes to integration, verification, validation. When a system is part of a system of systems, the interactions with other systems and the system of systems is of critical importance. We take a holistic view, understanding that the overall behavior is the function of interactions with the external systems, as well as the interactions of the, all the parts that are internal to our architecture. 
And the last section deals with system verification validation activities that occur in the typical on the right side of the V. Every need and every requirement is a verification validation instance, and we have to define success criteria, strategy, and method for each instance. These are combined into activities that are then addressed within procedures then that are executed. Out of that comes execution records that are combined into an approval package that are given to an approval authority. And then we have a qualified, accepted, certified, approved system. There are a lot of artifacts. It's very complex. And so a key control monitoring activity concerns the planning preparation for overseeing this. The success criteria strategy and method need to be defined when you write a need or requirement statement. And then you're going to mature that throughout the life cycle. And this is especially important when there's a customer supplier relationship. The responsibility for system verification, validation activities, and deliverables must be clearly defined in the statement of work. We have a whole chapter just on that in the manual. As a result of all the management, we have a baseline configuration controlled set of needs, design input requirements, design output specifications, all of our interface definition documents. We have change management artifacts, our mission goals and objectives, measures, our risk, life cycle concepts, all the model elements in our different types of models that we developed, all of our allocation budgeting records, our traceability records, verified validated systems, subsystem elements, system verification artifacts, system validation artifacts. A lot of people see this and their heads start swimming, but there is no easy button. Um, sorry, you know, especially the more complex we get, it just takes a lot of work. If we haven't addressed the management of our needs, requirements, verification, validation up front, define the processes, enforce those processes, train people in that, we're going to have all kinds of issues. So with that, I've finished with the presentation. So we can go to question and okay. discussions. Wonderful. Thank you, Lou. A really good presentation. We do have a few questions queued up here. Terry Fitzgerald has a couple questions. What are the pros and cons uh, to keeping your functional and your performance requirements, or which would fall into the class of non-functional requirements, separate from your performance requirements? I'm very opinionated on that. Like in the guide writing requirements, a functional requirement without performance is not verifiable. It's ambiguous. You know, just say, go do a function. If you don't talk about the performance aspects for that function, then you got issues. When we're organizing requirements within our products, we talk about five basic categories of requirements. We have a functional performance, which are our primary functions of what the whole intent of the system is. Why do we have it? What's it supposed to do? But also how well it does it. Then we have a call operational or fit requirements. How does the system fit into the overall system? And then there's going to be other functional requirements that are not primary, but they're enabling functions for the primary and maybe like safety and security functionality. It gives you the capabilities that you need so you can successfully do the primary functions. Then we have the physical attributes. We have quality, the abilities, and then we have compliance. And so these five buckets that I'm talking about are really designed for you to look at your system from different perspectives mm -hmm. and make sure you don't leave any of those out. Because if you leave any of those perspectives out, you're going to have missing requirements. Now, from a modeling standpoint, we start with functions and we talk about flow and data, but we can develop a whole model and never address performance. To me, kind of missing the point because mm -hmm. everyone cares about performance. And regardless, we deal with them as requirement sets at a minimum. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that makes sense. So Dr. Arbaki has a question. Do the technical performance measurements, TPMs, need to be quantified when drafting the system requirements? And the reason this is being asked is it's often it's hard to quantify a TPM in a requirement without some initial testing. So from your experience, what would you suggest? The process that we have in the needs requirements manual, so we start with the problem statement, and then we define a mission statement, goals and objectives, and measures. And this is also defined as the engineering handbook in the business and mission analysis part. So those measures, we're talking about what are our expectations for the end product. But like you say, feasibility is an issue. We don't start with just requirements. The mission goals and objectives and measures are a top level of our needs. But then we gather a whole lot of other information from our stakeholders, drivers' constraints, our risk assessments, 
And we develop a set of preliminary life cycle concepts. We know that there's a whole lot of uncertainties. There's inconsistencies, conflicts with all the information. So we spend a whole lot of time doing analysis and maturing our life cycle concepts. And that's a big thing that modeling helps us with is maturing those. And we're going to do a technology readiness assessment of all the performance values, all the measures to see if we have the technology needed to do that. So concurrently, the design team is involved in this because feasibility is in the physical world. So our design team needs to say, do we have a technology that allows that performance value to be made? There's a concept of technology readiness levels that we can define for each of those measures. And then we can have technology maturation plan for that. And then once we've established feasibility or we have a plan for achieving that feasibility, then that's going to be reflected both in our needs and then in our design input requirements. Then when I talk about the TBRs and TBXs, that's where that comes in. Because if we're still not sure about the feasibility of a number, then we want to use the TBR, TBX for that. Terry has another question here. Should the SE write test requirements on the subsystem? Is it common practice in, in your experience? There's a lot of debate on what a test case is and what test requirements are. What we're defining is that we have attributes that are associated with verification validation for each need and requirement statement. So up front, we talk about defining what the success criteria is that a test case needs to show. If the requirements are well written, that criteria should be evident within the requirement statement. Then we have to talk about the method. We have test as one method, but we also have demonstration, inspection, analysis. We have to define what the method's going to be. And there's a different cost and risk and confidence level associated with each method. And so that's really a management decision when you select the method because it affects cost and schedule and, like I say, risk. And then there's strategy. If it's a test, what's our strategy for doing the test? That activity is going to be done, what we call per procedure, a written steps that someone's going to follow to actually run the test or do the verification method. And so we're going to write requirements against the procedure that then when the procedure is written or formulated, it implements all those procedure requirements based on the method, the strategy, the success criteria. And it's going to include quality control steps in there and also I know in the software world, they talk about having a test case written for each requirement. That's fine, but in a hybrid system, it takes on a whole new meaning. So I define in the, in the manual, section 10, when we talk about test activity or a verification validation activity, that's analogous to a test case. In the organization I'm in, our test engineering department, they actually would write the test requirements, the test environment, test data type of requirements, but the system engineer is always involved in reviewing them upfront so that uh, we ensure that our verification will in fact yield compliance evidence uh, and save that time. We don't want to find out that it's the, the wrong test too far down the road. So, And the confidence of, in the data, if I do run one test and it's successful, is that enough for me to say it's going to mm -hmm. work all the time? The other thing is, is this why I talked about at the very beginning, we got project management involved, is because all of those decisions impact cost and schedule and risk. So yeah. if there's a project management element to that that we can't ignore, yeah. especially if people did not bid enough for the system verification validation activities, which is common. I'll see some people say, well, we bid 20% of our budget. And I said, well, you failed because it shows it's going to take at least 50% if you did a good job. It's going right. to take a lot more if you didn't. Yes. So that's a yeah. big issue. So it's all the more important that when we establish that verification criteria, we really need to assess it, you know, as you say, time, cost, effort. Yeah. Two more questions. Okay, this is a good one. What are some good requirements management tools to use? Uh, this comes yeah. from Andrew Garbutt. There's a lot of good ones out there. And Kosi has a tools database that about every tool vendor has a system engineering tool has input data in that, and you can put in different criteria. You want to pick a tool that meets your needs and adds value to your particular organization product line. A tool that works for one company, it may be a shotgun when all you need is a BB gun. Section, I think, 16 of the Needs and Requirements Manual lists features that you may want to have in your tool by selecting those features. And so defining your requirements for a tool allows you to be an informed buyer. And then you go to different tool vendors. I've worked a little bit with several tools, and JAMA Connect is one 
that meets all my tick boxes. But a big thing also is remember I showed the picture that we have a tool set. So we need to be able to pick tools that allow us to share and interchange data or link data between tools. And so that's something to look for also. So a lot of criteria that's defined in that. I recommend you go read that section, to figure out what meets your needs for your organization, and then pick out candidate tools from the tool database that NCOSI offers. Yeah. And then you can invite the vendors in to give you demonstrations and so on. That's really good. And I like what you bring up, Lou, about uh, you know for, for an MBSE environment to get tools that play together. I know I've struggled with some tools getting the data exchange between the tools. So that could be an important factor when selecting a tool. So the good news is to survive in the future, mm -hmm. most of the tool vendors have come to that realization. Yes. So they're either partnering up with certain other tool vendors or they're adhering to the overall standards that right. we have a working group in the COSI that's working with those standards to allow that interoperability, shareability of data. Good. Last question comes from Terry again. So, and this is treating the system as a black box. What is the best practice to allocate an operational use case to the next level of decomposition? And he goes on stating uh, al allocating the use case to the main subsystem or breaking up the use case into multiple steps and allocating steps to the subsystems. I think he's probably coming from a software application standpoint, standalone software application. But from a system engineering standpoint, where we have a hybrid hardware and software systems, as part of the licitation activity in Section 4 of the Needs and Requirements Manual, we select a whole family of use cases, not just operations, but use cases across the life cycle. So when I say life cycle concepts, we're talking about all the life cycle, not just operations. Mm -hmm. um, that's too narrow of a focus. So we're, what we're really looking at, the capabilities the functionality and performance that allows us to address multiple use cases. And so we do the analysis as inputs of all the different use cases. We figure out what capabilities we need and then what functionality is needed for those capabilities. And there's going to be overlap and then what performance is needed. And then we write needs based on those capabilities, function, performance. So that's from a black box standpoint or a closed box standpoint. And then those needs are transformed into a set of design input requirements where we do the underlying engineering analysis. What does the system need to do to meet those needs? So if there's a need statement to have a certain function or capability, then we'll define specific shell statements that when implemented by design will result in a system that provides that capability. So we're not yeah. focused on individual use cases. We're mm -hmm. integrating those together to find out a set of capabilities, functionality, right. performance that allows us to do all the use cases. Yes, and, yes. From, and the big thing from security standpoint, now we're focusing on what we call misuse cases and loss scenarios. And we're addressing what capabilities do we need to address those as well? Because security can't be something that's added on. Security mm. is something that's gotta be built in from the beginning. No, that's good. I subscribe to that thinking, absolutely. We do have one last question that just came in. Uh, Steve okay. Rubin is asking, how do you validate the higher level needs? And, and he asked again, operations research? The needs themselves, I don't know, when he says higher level needs. If you're talking about mission statement goals, objectives, and measures, those would have been implemented within your integrated set of needs, which are transformed into the requirements. From a validation standpoint, there's an old thing from in the space business, flies you test, test as you fly. And so all of those use cases and operational scenarios and user stories, those are the basis of our validation procedures. And so we'll say, can we actually perform this use case with the system as it was designed? Can we get objective evidence that our goals and objectives have been met? We've met our measures. That's part of our validation planning and the, the strategy, how we're going to do validation is different than verifying you met a specific requirement. Validation, can the system be used for its intended purpose by its intended users in the intended environment? And does it allow unintended users to use it in unintended ways? You know, that kind of a thing. Yeah. So yeah, it's a lot more involved. Constraints. Yeah. So that's where all those use cases, misuse cases, lost scenarios, all that comes in. That's going right. to help with plan our validation. It's important to get those fully described. As you say, the environment, any constraints, any conditions, 
from my experience, it's important to keep those up to date. And if there's things you don't know, to populate it when you can. I've had that experience where the VNV team, particularly in this case, the validation team, they depend on good use cases, good mission use cases to build their validation testing around. And so if you give them bad information or partial information, that's going to impact the quality of the validation. And NASA, they have a thing what they call design reference missions. They'll define a spacecraft that its potential could do different missions. And so that's what I say. You take all the different operational scenarios and you combine them and develop a set of capabilities, functionality, and performance that allow you to do any of them. Let's say here's a design reference mission where we're going to use this in this space mission, but we're going to use the same spacecraft in a different one that requires different capabilities performance. But yes. because we looked at all of those cases, we built a spacecraft that can do and support each one. All right. Well, with that, I think we'll bring this to a close. I'd like to thank you one more time, Lou. It was a pleasure to have you join us. I really enjoyed this session. Well, this is something that impacts our day-to-day -day work as systems engineers. Yeah. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Lou. I'm going to stop the recording.